Hashtag psychotherapy on Fox with Mark Fielding. Hello, welcome to episode five, series five of Hashtag Psychotherapy Unfogged. As you know, I'm Mark Fielding, psychotherapist and relationship counsellor and your host. Today, I have the absolute pleasure to introduce Deirdre Redden. Um, uh, Deirdre, Deirdre, Deirdre is a, a, a parent coach and mentor disordered eating coach and a mental health third aid, first aider. Um, she helps parents to understand the important role that they play in their loved one's eating disorder recovery and teaches them the tools and techniques to provide help and support. She does this by helping them to understand the eating disorder illness better, giving them the tools and techniques they need to better support their child, no matter their age, helping them feel listened to, understood and supported. Parents deserve support too. It is a crisis. Supporting parents to support their loved one can help to accelerate the recovery process and has been proven to be twice as effective as working with the person directly. Deirdre also works with individuals who have developed a problematic relationship with food, helping them to transform their relationship both with food and with themselves through positive behavioural change. She is passionate about helping people to foster and role model a healthy relationship with food, weight and body image. Um, Deirdre is a member of the International Association of Eating Disorder Professionals and a member of the European Mentoring and Coaching Council. So really nice to see you again, Deirdre. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me, Mark. I'm delighted to be here. Yeah, really nice to have you here. Um, I always kick off the show by asking our guests about the personal experiences that led them into the field. And so perhaps we could start there. Sure, absolutely. So um, for me, it was being a parent um, of uh, a loved one with an eating disorder. So my daughter developed an eating disorder in her teenage years. Um, and thankfully, she is well now, but she was quite unwell for a period of time. Um, and at the time I was working in banking, so I was mm. very much in the corporate world, but I devoted a lot of time and effort and energy to help her get well or support her because mm. as parents, we can't make them get well much and all as we might like to. Mm. Um, and then I suppose, honestly, she, when she became well, she became my role model in so many ways. She built the life for herself that she wanted. Um, and I suppose I decided I wanted a bit of that too. So um, I left banking, retrained as a coach. Um, and I just always had the kind of eating disorder experience in my head, I guess, and decided to turn my attention to working with parents who are traveling that journey. Because I do remember from my own time, it's a good while ago now, but I do remember how lonely and isolating um, yeah. it is and how little support there is for parents really so I, I've kind of done a big shift I guess in my career yeah. and ended up where I am now. Yeah so I guess it, it yeah I guess your daughter's Ill illness caused the shift really interesting to say that your kind of daughter became your role model mm -hmm. in terms of her recovery I just wonder could you just say a little bit more about that I mean that's a really interesting thing that she became your role model she made changes I'm guessing in her life. <laughs> Well, she just kind of fulfilled her dreams. She didn't really, yeah. really make, she was a teenager at the time, but she wanted to, you know, pursue a certain career. Um, her life was on hold really for mm. a number of years because of the illness. So she built the life she wanted. She pursued her dreams uh, to be a teacher as it mm. happens. Um, she kept all her friends, but she expanded her network of friends. Mm. Um, and she just traveled. She's she's in Australia now. So she kind of just followed her own sort of dreams really, mm. um, and built the life that she wanted for herself, mm. um, which was very motivating for me, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So it was post-traumatic growth, I would say I experienced, yeah. Mark, that's how I would yeah. describe it now, I guess, with the language I have now that yeah. maybe I didn't have then. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm a big believer in post-traumatic growth. I mean, it doesn't always happen, but I mean, obviously, mm. obviously quite a lot of times, I think when it has been trauma, there can be accelerated personal growth. And I guess this is what you're, you're talking about, Deirdre. I mean, m moving on to your work with families. Massive question, but how does an eating disorder coming into a family system how can it affect a family i mean i know it depends on the family but do you do you, do you see any patterns really 
So I suppose the important thing to remember about eating disorders is that we never necessarily know what causes them. No. So, you know, no more than any other mental illness, I guess, is just so many different things that come together. So historically, there was a view that parents caused an eating disorder, but that view has now been, thankfully, very much disproven. Yes. Mm. And the piece, I guess, that isn't quite understood as yet is A, the role the parents play in recovery, no matter the age of the person, but B, the impact on the family system as a whole. Yeah. So there is... Um, it might be an unfortunate expression these days, but it, it's like a bomb going off in the family. It affects everybody. Yeah. So there has been some great research. Um, so there, you know, no more than the whole eating disorder field. There are there isn't enough research. <laughs> a lot of the research mm. is focused on adolescents yeah. and there isn't a lot of research on the impact on parents. But there was a study done in Australia last year um, and it highlighted the impact on parents of adolescents suffering with anorexia. So I think it was about 400 parents were interviewed mm. and it was found that, you know, the incidence of parents suffering clinical levels of depression and anxiety yeah. uh, was very high. The impact on their physical health, their yeah. emotional health, their romantic relationships. And yeah. um, so it's quite profound. And the focus always is very much on the individual and getting help for mm. the individual. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the entire family need to be supported. And I would mm. also say, I don't have the research to prove to back it up, but siblings also are really impacted um, too because they're worried for their sibling. The parent's attention is often diverted to the individual who's unwell yeah. um, and it's very time consuming. You know, I think that survey in Australia found, I think the parents were devoting 20 hours a week to supporting their love, loved one. Um, so it's quite a, it's quite a significant impact and I'm not sure that people quite grasp that. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I guess it's similar to kind of, I guess, the emergence of any maybe mental or physical illness in the family system. You know, that it ripples. I mean, ripple is probably not strong enough a word, but it, but it erupts mm. through the family system. And and I guess historically, the families have have struggled to find support. The focus has been on the individual with the distressed eating eating disorder, and the family really have just been left to cope. Yes, and I yeah. think the difference with an eating disorder. Um, versus other mental illnesses is typically when somebody is recovering from an eating disorder, there's a requirement to eat quite regularly. So yes. no matter what type of eating disorder you have, regular eating um, is necessary. Yeah. So for parents, particularly parents of adolescents, there's a lot of mealtime supervision. Yeah. So there is, of course, the emotional impact, but there's actually also the practical implications of supervising maybe three meals and three snacks mm. a day. So it just brings another layer of complexity, mm. um, I think. Uh, so certainly over the last number of years for adolescents, family-based treatment, uh, which involves the parents supervising meals, as I've just said, mm. um, is the gold standard for adolescents with anorexia particularly. Mm. But families of adults haven't really been included in the treatment team. And I guess what we find in our work as part of supported families um, is the parents still have a role to play. Um, yeah. They might be supervising meals, but people who are suffering with an eating disorder still need a lot of emotional support and maybe practical support around food, for example. Mm -hmm. And parents don't always have the, the language they don't have the tools because they haven't been educated and equipped. And sometimes I would find in my work, sometimes the language they can use is triggering. Mm -hmm. Not their fault. They just don't realize because they don't understand. So sometimes having the, yeah. the tools and the language can make such a difference. Mm -hmm. And it is unfortunate that when somebody, you know, I, I always say that like somebody didn't doesn't wake up one morning and be an adult when they were 17 the day before. No. So the fact that they're, you know, they're they're cut out mm. of the treatment process, um, it makes it very challenging for parents because they have all the big emotions going on. They're worried, yeah. Yeah. they can be frustrated, yeah. they can be angry, they can be upset, they can feel guilty. They wonder, what did I do to cause this? Um, yeah. So the more equipped and empowered they can be, the more effective um they can be in supporting their loved one. So we would love, <laughs> I suppose that's our 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 pipe dream that the parents would kind of form part of that treatment team 
Mm. And I think you can do that very safely without breaching any confidentiality between therapist mm. um, and client. Mm. So uh, it would be great um, to see that. And even within that, Mark, family can be a loose term, you know, because certain families, there can right. be challenges within the fam family dynamics. Mm. Yeah. So so people who are recovering from an eating disorder do need support, but that can be a friend or mm. it can be somebody else. It doesn't always necessarily have to be the family. Yeah, I mean, in terms of working with families, yeah, because I guess a lot of families where maybe an eating disorder might arise know nothing about eating disorders at all. So, I mean, I guess it probably takes some, fa I mean, again, you know, it depends on the family, but I guess with some families, it would take a while really for them to even pick up that perhaps something was wrong. Complex totally. for them, not knowing. Yeah, yeah. So, so I always say to parents, you know, it's like you've landed on another planet. Yeah. The language is different. There's no manual for this because it's never something you expect to deal no. with um, as a parent. So it is quite, uh, it does take some time to kind of get your head around it almost. And I think too, with eating disorders, the reality is the symptoms only the eating disorder is there for quite a while before the symptoms yeah. become really apparent. Um, and I think in the world that we live in, where, you know, it's so appearance focused, there's such pressure on people to be a certain body shape. Yeah. Um, there's such, you know, we praise exercise. We never think about whether the exercise is too much, you know, so we, we live yeah. in a world where I have air quotes around healthy eating um, and exercise is praised. So sometimes it can just be really hard to spot, actually, mm -hmm. that there there is an issue because we think that healthy eating is a good thing. We think if our our child, no matter what age they are, is exercising, that's a good thing. And it's not always. So it's hard. We're kind of we're going against the tide in some ways um, mm -hmm. when we spot these symptoms. And, and I guess when when you know parents or, or whatever the family system is, you know, around the around the person with the eating disorder, do start to realise there is something going on. I mean, you mentioned kind of shame earlier. I mean, I guess a lot of parents probably blame themselves, you know, completely unfairly. I mean, is, is that something that you find parents yeah. do? Yeah. Yeah. There, yes, they do. They, there's yeah. a huge amount of guilt. You know, what did I do? Um, yeah how how have I kind of uh, impacted this? So it's very important for parents to kind of, it's a grieving process almost for parents, Mark, yeah. I think, because um, unfortunately people with eating disorders, the recovery process can take time. For yeah. some people it doesn't, thankfully, but you know, it, it can take time. Um, and to an extent, the person who is suffering um, gets absorbed by the illness almost, it's all consuming. Yeah. So yeah. you kind of lose the person for a period of time and in lots of ways because their emotions can be numbed because uh, it's yeah. a brain based disorder. So their brain is is uh, is working differently um, yeah. during the time uh, that they're sick. So for parents, they have to kind of go through an acceptance process yeah. and, and a grieving process and accept that they haven't caused it themselves. So it it, yeah. it is uh, because it's really hard, you know, as as a parent, particularly, you know, you just, you know, it's like when you're parent of a small child and they fall and you just want to kiss it make it better yeah. um, and unfortunately with eating disorders no matter how hard we try and I tried very hard we can't yeah. fix it we can just support so kind of just coming to terms with all of that can be a lot um, for parents yeah. but they have to remember that they are still the expert on their child no matter yeah. the age of the child the child yeah. is still there um, and they should. So lots of parents sometimes can lose confidence in their parenting because they think, yeah. oh, my gosh, have I caused this? What have I done wrong? Yeah. So helping them to kind of process all of that is really important um, and helping them to kind of empower them and equip them really with the skills. But also really, really, really important that they hold on to the hope because mm -hmm. recovery is always possible and likely mm -hmm. in lots of cases. So it's so important that the family members around the person hold on to hope when maybe the person themselves can't yeah yeah i guess they hold the hope for the person totally th yeah. themselves yeah i mean as we kind of explore you know the work i mean i thinking about kind of your you know position you know with supporting the family i mean goodness me it it must be terribly complex i mean families are terribly complex things anyway aren't they you know and i i guess the support so i mean i'm trying to ask a question here so let me just try and be a little bit 
a little bit more direct. So it's it's a mix a mixture of support, education, and then helping the family with the kind of practical aspects. Yeah. Yeah. It is really. It absolutely okay. is, and it's it. Yeah. It can be whatever is going on at the time. Yeah. You know. So, so clearly, somebody who is suffering from an eating disorder, um, they're emotionally dysregulated. Their nervous yes. system has been triggered, so they're experiencing a lot of anxiety around food. Mm. Equally, as parents, we're experiencing a lot of yes, anxiety of around food. Yeah. So it's managing that emotional regulation helping the parents to mind themselves yeah. um, so that they can try and co-regulate um, or, you know, manage the emotions um, mm. of their loved one, yeah. helping them to look after themselves. So I'm mm. a coach and um, I'm a big believer in strengths-based approaches. So again, yeah. as parents, we can forget <laughs> our strengths because it yeah. is a crisis, as you've said, yeah. you said at the intro. So yeah. even just helping them to find out, leverage their strengths, Who's best yeah. at doing what, you know, yeah. so maybe the mom is good at one thing. Maybe the dad is really good at something mm. else. So just making them all feel feel part of it, really. Yeah. So really focusing on their strengths, I guess, really helping to support them and give them re renew their confidence, really, in terms of how they parent themselves and dealing with the eating disorder. I mean, I wanted to ask you, can can very young people develop eating disorders? I, I, yeah, I mean, how, how young can people be? They can be very, so I suppose increase, so historically, I guess, um, for anorexia, for example, there was always a myth, and I can't stress enough that it was a myth, that it was sort of an illness that affected teenage girls. The reality is it affects, every, you know, eating disorders affect people at all ages of life. Yeah, so women can develop eating disorders at the menopause. Uh, for men, it's a lot more prevalent now than, than historically. Yeah. Um, so the ages, I guess, Mark, are getting, they are getting younger. Um, so, for example, if you were to cast your mind back to COVID, it was a perfect storm in lots of ways for, for eating disorders. So people were, you know, seven and eight developing eating disorders. And some of it was because there was such a focus on healthy eating and exercise. Um, and the positive was that they were at home so the parents could spot the issues uh, quicker. But also... There is a newer eating disorder now called ARFID, which is Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder. Um, so it's where, you know, young children can have sensory issues around food or textural issues. You know, they might only eat beige food, um, yeah. for example. Uh, so that can affect really young kids, kind of typically from the age of three and four on. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess with, with, with ARFID, I, I guess... There's maybe sometimes a link with kind of new eye divergence. Autism. Yeah. Yeah. Autism, autism particularly. Yeah. 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 But it is an eating disorder in its own right. So I heard yeah. it described recently as autistic eating. It's not. It is a clinically mm. um, defined uh, eating mm. disorder. Um, but yes, there is a higher, but there is a higher uh, prevalence rate amongst the autistic population or people with autism um, and eating mm. disorders. There is a link mm. or correlation rather there as well. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned around kind of messaging now around healthy eating and exercise and, you know, wanting to link in social media and, you know, particularly, I guess, maybe millennials, Gen Z, you know, growing up in a world of social media, which is a very different world to the one that I grew, I grew up in. I mean, I just wonder how much influence you think that has on producing eating disorders, because there is so much focus, isn't there, on, on body and, yeah, I just, what what, what do you see? I think it's 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 possibly it it sorry it does impact I think but it's possibly too simplistic to, to kind of okay. I'm not suggesting you're blaming it on social media mark no, at all no. but no. I think parents have a huge role to play you know okay. we are kind of key influencers in our in our young people yeah. um so children will do as we do not do as we say so if we're in the mm. home and we're talking about not liking how we look, that we've gained weight, uh, yeah. that we can't do an activity or we won't go into photographs because we don't like how we look, that can impact yeah. um, our young people too. Um, absolutely, social media, there are lots of challenges around that. You know, So mm -hmm. for young boys, particularly the whole focus on 
building muscle, eating loads of protein. Yeah. Um, you know, I think 5% of the world's population look like the kind of so-called thin ideal. So it's unattainable for lots of us. Yeah. I have would have a huge issue with all these what I eat in a day posts on Instagram. I think they're mm. really unhelpful. So absolutely, it's really important with our young people that we try and teach them how to maybe curate their social media and mm be a little bit critical of what they're seeing. Um, mm. So it, I think it does play a role. Of course it does. And body image concerns and body image concerns are so high. I think almost three quarters of young people don't like how they look and they yeah. body concerns, body image concerns start at the age of three and four. Um, so seeing all these people filtered on social media doesn't mm. help. But I do think um, there's a lot that we can do ourselves in terms of role modeling. Mm. Yeah, and, I guess and again, what, that's sorry, yeah, and that's okay. again all about educating parents and raising mm. awareness because mm. you know this, uh, you're not handed a manual <laughs> with all of this stuff no. when you become a parent. So it's it's there's a great uh, Maya Angelou quote: "When we know better, we do better." So we mm. don't what we don't know, we can do nothing about. But when mm. we learn, um, we we can maybe just watch how we speak about food. So there again, like there's a huge moral value placed on food. Mm. It's is it good food or bad food? Mm. It's food. Mm. So we need to kind of move away from the the emotion around food and how we describe it, I think. Yeah, and and I guess so easy for parents to, you know, when when you know when there were children around to talk about, you know, I mean diets and, you know, wanting to go to the gym. I guess they they're conversations that probably so many adults have really so I guess in a way it's kind of maybe re-educating a little bit because I guess children will kind of internalize maybe some of that but goodness me so common and, and what you're saying around you know previously there was an idea that you know that anorexia the rosa was you know just kind of was kind of teenage girls that was the the stereotype I mean there were so many men now with eating disorders I yeah. watched uh I, I th- I forget, I forget exactly the show, but it was Freddie Flintoff, I think, yes. talking about his bulimia. Yeah. And I thought that was great, you know, to have a man, a sportsman, even though he was, you know, a little bit ambivalent around. Uh, Very ambivalent. <laughs> yeah. Whether it's a problem or not, I think that really helps. I mean, I just wonder with the, with the males, and this, again, you know, is depending on the male, do males feel more shame around it? I mean, is it just one thing, what, what it's like for a male to have an eating disorder? Does it differ, do you think, in terms of gender? Um, it related? does. Yeah. Yeah, it does generally. Yeah, it does. Mm. It it tends not to be as much around, um, you know, the, the, the weight side of things. Yeah. Um, it doesn't. So dieting is tends to be a key predictor of an eating disorder. Um so for, for the males, maybe there can be more over exercising. Um, there's a there's absolutely more more and it's, sorry, it's more of what uh, what's called in the US bigorexia. So it's it's about kind of you know the bulking up and uh, yeah. all that kind kind of thing. But for males, it's it, there's a double whammy for males because it's a mental illness. So okay. you know, and yeah. it is changing and it is becoming. You know, it is less stigmatizing, but we still have a long way to go. And then eating disorders have historically been perceived as a female illness, too. So, you know, even kind of acknowledging um, that that you have an eating disorder is really, really hard. So it is so brilliant to see the Freddie Flintoffs, the Ed Sheerans coming out and speaking um, about what's going on for them, um, because uh, we need to kind of start those conversations, I think, mm-hmm. um, so that men can feel feel more comfortable. And then the other challenge, too, is that a lot of people who work in the eating disorder field are female. So, you know, finding kind of male therapists for 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 men to speak to can be mm-hmm. can be difficult as well. But there's great work happening in, the, in that area, in the UK particularly mm-hmm. um, as well. Yeah, I think there's more understanding. Yeah, I mean, I, I I always think it's so helpful when a celebrity comes out and talks about their own yeah. personal experience. You know, because I mean, so many people, I don't know, so 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 many people hear it. I mean, I guess it's just their reach, isn't it? Really, you know, in a lot of ways. It, I want to want to just move around a little bit and just ask around your your mental uh, mental health first aid. Could you could you just say say a little bit about that? What it is and yeah, sure. a bit more. Yeah, totally. Yes. So um, I I uh, instruct in youth mental health first aid. So that's mental health first aid for adults who either work with or live or support uh, young people. So mental health first aid originated in Australia. 
um, back in, I think, 2000. And it was uh, a nurse, mental health nurse, who had her, whose name escapes me, I'm afraid, who had her own challenges with mental health and came up with the blindingly obvious in hindsight idea that, you know, there's a physical first aid. So why is there not a mental health yeah, first aid? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so it has now been rolled out uh, around the world um, and it's a two day course and it essentially gives people um, the tools to support a young person who mm. is uh showing signs that they're struggling with mm. their uh, mental health. So I love seeing pairs. So it covers the main uh, mental illnesses, including eating disorders. Uh, so I love to see parents attend um, the uh, this training. So it's teachers, sport coaches, uh, social workers, youth workers typically attend the training um, and parents as well, because the more mental health, so exactly the conversation we were having about males and eating disorders, the more mental health literacy that we have, the more equipped, because that's what it's all about, really, isn't it? It's about being equipped to yeah. spot the signs um, uh, the more kind of empowered we feel and the more confident we feel if we are supporting somebody and it's first aid. So we're not, you know, we're not going to put on <laughs> the white coat. We're not going to be clinicians. We're not going to right. diagnose. It's very much just supporting the young person um, and getting them to professional help, which I recognize mm. is not necessarily straightforward in the UK or here mm. in Ireland at the moment, mm. unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, we we had a, I went think way back in in I think it was maybe a first series we had a we had a mental health first aider on that worked in the NHS and I just thought it was fantastic I mean I I'm, I may be remembering this wrong but I'm sure she said something like the mission statement was to something like to have 20 percent of the world's population trained in mental health first aid which I thought was what a fantastic mission statement i mean I, I i just really love the idea of more people being trained to help others and 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 i guess you know and i guess the more people that are trained as mental health for health first aiders i guess the less stigma there is in terms of people opening up about their mental health i mean it, it's such a positive thing I mean, what, what, so, so what do you do do you i mean what what, what exactly is your role i mean how do you so I just work in it. yeah yeah so we just train I I suppose so so um we we again have a big believer in tools Mark so uh we 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 teach people a tool basically that they can use to um support a young person so it's literally just because knowledge is power really yeah. and truly so um empowering them empowering them to or educating them to understand what the early warning signs are for lots yeah. of these so whether it be depression yeah. um, whether it be psychosis eating disorders anxiety um, and how to support somebody what to do what to yeah. say what not to say and yeah. then just kind of helping them to see the pathway to to further help mm -hmm. so uh, what professional supports what kind of emotional sports um yeah. are there uh, as well so it's really um about empowering um people um mm. to to support somebody and honestly and i'm sure you see it a lot of the time in your own work too sometimes people just need somebody to listen yeah it's sometimes it's not any more than that yeah. you know so uh and i think particularly as parents as i said earlier we we have a tendency to listen to fix rather than listen to understand yeah. because we're used to problem solving. That's what we do. It's hardwired yeah. as a parent. And I suppose when you're faced with a mental, some a young person who's struggling with their mental health or an eating disorder, sometimes we just need to listen to understand mm. and just give people the space. So sometimes mental health first aid can be that simple. Sometimes mm. it can be more complicated, clearly. Uh, but, but some, and I think for us then as mental health, as first aiders or supporters, um, it's it's having the knowledge to know that what we're doing is the right thing. Mm. Yeah, give us the confidence and help us to feel empowered to to move forward and support somebody. Mm. Yeah, and I totally agree. I mean, for for a lot of people, really, I think you know, being seen, being heard, is enough. Yeah, I think it sometimes you know it. Yeah, I mean, it, it it's so so powerful, isn't it? I think you know, having somebody that feels safe enough to open up 
around their mental health and then you know they're opening up to someone who who listens and hears and understands I mean that in itself I think is tremendously powerful absolutely and yeah. clearly the the work that we do with mental health first aid is evidence-based uh, yeah. so it takes all yeah. you know international research and yeah. and it can be very challenging and confronting sometimes for people to learn that if you're concerned about somebody um in terms of whether they're at risk of taking their own life yeah. uh, is to ask them and ask them directly and yeah. even just having that knowledge so if you ever find yourself in the position that you know you ask the direct unambiguous question particularly irish people are great at dancing around things um but uh, the evidence uh mm. the evidence-based approach is ask the question so mm. even being yeah. empowered with that information knowing that that is what all the international research states mm. uh means that you just feel more empowered um so i think that's the benefit of a training uh like that yeah i mean absolutely if, if people w- want to get hold of you um and obviously we'll put your links on our social media platforms after after the show how do they get in touch yeah absolutely well i'm on linkedin and supportfamilies.ie yeah. is our website so that's uh where we run the online group programs um for parents yeah, fantastic. And as our listeners will know, you know, we'll, we'll put all of your links on, you know, our various social media sites, you know, after the show. It, it's really flown today. I mean, I've, I, as always, I've written down about 100 questions. I've asked you about 10. But uh, <laughs> I always ask our guests at the end of the show to maybe share, you know, their own coping strategies, their own strategies for day to day sustaining good mental health. Um, so let me just ask, ask you, that. What, what, what do you do to sustain your own good mental health? Sure. Well, I do remember when uh, when my daughter was unwell, uh, we were told, you know, you have to mind yourself, too. And I remember thinking, how in God's name do I have time (laughs) to mind myself when she's so unwell? Uh, But I have learned. So I suppose sometimes, you know, people who are supporting somebody who who um, has a a mental illness can feel like, oh, my gosh, I don't have time. Um, But. I have learned how important it is and back to the conversation we had earlier about the emotional regulation piece and kind of managing that for you so you can support somebody else. Um, So for me, uh, I love the fresh air. Um, For me, getting out for a walk is really important, just Mm. getting the fresh air. I'm one of these mad people who go sea swimming year round. So uh, (laughs) that is one of the best things you can ever do for your mental health, believe you me. And I always thought people were nuts who did it <laughs> until I learned the benefits um of yeah. it uh so I go hill walking and mm. yeah it's just the fresh air um and piano I play some piano so that keeps yeah. me going <laughs> yeah yeah I mean in terms of the cold water swimming yeah I mean I guess I'm one of those people you know I mean I I read some of the research you know and I know people that do it and it really does you know it's the, 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 there's so many health benefits mm. to it but can I just ask when you first started doing it what was your experience? I guess you get used to it. But when you first start immersing yourself in really cold water, I mean, what what is that like initially? It must feel quite odd, I'd imagine. Um, I started during COVID, actually, because, yeah. you know, there was not so much to do. So no, uh, I'm no. fortunate I'm not too far from the sea. I would say... I can't recall because it's a few years ago now, but it's never as cold as you think it's going to be. Okay. Yes, it is cold. Yeah. But it's never, it's never quite as yeah. cold as you. So if you're somebody who's standing there looking at all these, you know, mm. lunatics in the sea in the middle of winter, thinking, "Oh my God, how could they do that?" Mm. It doesn't actually feel as cold as mm. you think it might. Mm. And standing there at the edge, it's never cold, even though you might think it is. Mm. But yes, of course, the sea is cold and I don't live near the North Sea or anything, so it's not as cold. Yeah. Um, but it's you feel great afterwards. You mightn't really particularly enjoy it all the time when you're in there, but you do feel great afterwards. Yeah, I mean, that, this is what I hear. The feeling afterwards is is a really, really fantastic feeling. I've read stuff, but we don't have to go into this now, but I've read stuff about the immune system and, you know, there's, yeah. there's increasingly research around the benefits of it. You know, it's a really, yeah. really fascinating area. We're, we're, all, we're kind of almost at the end. Deirdre. Is there anything that you would like to say that I've not given you the opportunity to? 
Um, yes. One last thing, I guess, just mm. again around parents, because that's the work that I do. Yes. So um, the research is there. Getting support helps you and it does help your loved one, because, again, if you think about it, if somebody is going through outpatient um, treatment, they spend maybe an hour a week with the dietitian half an hour and an hour a week with the therapist that's a lot of hours um at home mm. uh, and if you can support the work of the dietitian and the therapist by being mm. educated and supported yourself yeah. you can make their work more effective and mm. more uh, efficient um and it's it's a, even for your own health just the research i've cited it's so important mm. but also i would say too don't forget that you are the expert on your child and keep yeah. advocating for them. Trust your gut. If you know that there's something not right, and I'm, I use the word child loosely, I mean adult as well as child. Um, but if you feel there's something not right and somebody like a medical professional is telling you, no, their BMI is fine, which is a whole other day's work, trust yes. your gut, advocate for your child. Don't give up, keep going um, yeah. and continue to play that role throughout their treatment. I think that, you know, so don't, don't feel shoved. Don't let yourself get shoved aside. I suppose you know you, you're there. Uh, you you know them best of all. So make sure, even if it's one way traffic, if your child is over eighteen, make yeah. sure you're feeding the information in, even if you're not getting anything in return. So you're letting the professionals know what you're seeing, mm. how your how your person um is doing. Yeah. So I think just don't lose sight that you matter too in all of this. I suppose. Yeah. OK. Well, listen, I just want to say this has been a really, really fascinating interview. It's gone really, really quickly. But I want to thank you so much for coming on the show, Deirdre. Thank you. I, I was delighted to be here and I really enjoyed our conversation. So I hope it's helpful to your listeners. Thanks a million, Mark. It's been nice to see you again. Thank you. I'd like to thank Deirdre so much for coming on. Um, <clears throat> More so than ever, really, you know, in the issue with with Deirdre, um, I just felt that we could have literally gone on for double the time. Um, so many more questions, you know, I, I could have asked, um, but so difficult really to, you know, to cover kind of all of Deirdre's, you know, not only her personal experience, you know, her experience as a, as a coach working with eating disorders uh, and also as a mental health third aid, first aid trainer, um, it just seemed to absolutely fly past. And I think this is always probably the problem with a 40 minute interview. Um, I know on some mental health podcasts, the interviews are much longer, but it is also, you know, it's always a conflict, really. One asking a guest really to spend, you know, that much time out of their busy day. You know, if I was going to ask for them to come on for an hour, for instance. You know, and also for our listeners, I mean, we all have busy lives and, you know, often I think probably people don't have an hour to listen to a podcast. Um, but I, I hope our listeners will will agree that, it, you know, it was a f absolutely fascinating podcast, even though unfortunately we did only get to touch on, you know, small areas uh, around Deirdre's, you know, vast experience. I mean, if you, if our listeners would like to get hold of Deirdre, um and request any of the services that she offers um please do check out our social media platforms and also the information and links which will be with this podcast and also our youtube channel um, and once again quick word about subscribing uh, as i always say if you are enjoying the youtube or the audio um, platforms for hashtag psychotherapy unfolds please do subscribe uh, and also please leave comments. I mean, Joe and I, you know, absolutely love receiving comments, you know. So, I mean, if you have, you know, good things to say, neutral things to say, or, you know, suggestions how we could, you know, make a better podcast, then, you know, we're really, really keen to to hear from you. I mean, Joe and I really absolutely love the feedback. Um, yeah, a YouTube channel not doing so well. It's a very different beast, I think, YouTube. Um, our audio platform i mean we're we're going up in numbers i mean we've we've had well over five thousand listens um and so the numbers are increasing more and more on our subscribers on spotify apple and some of the other, other podcast platforms are also really really shooting up um we've got some brilliant guests lined up um i'm not going to say much about our next guest um but our listeners will 
<laughs> will resonate when we actually do the interview um, with the fact that I'll be discussing a topic that um, I'm very, very passionate about um, and a topic that we have actually covered in quite a few of our previous series. Uh, I think our regular listeners are going to guess what that is. Um, got a great guest coming up. Um, so it should be really a fantastic interview. Sticking with our topic of relationships, um, we're covering relationships generally. So we've, we've had you know, part of our shows this series, such as you know relationship with subconscious, um, relationship with eating, I guess, and families in uh, with eating disorders in the last episode. We've had arguments, which I guess directly kind of feeds into relationships but i also really want to cover a lot more in terms of couples therapy relationship dynamics um maybe covering affairs and betrayals and i'm really i'm frantically searching at the moment for a couples therapist that uses the gottman method um it's a method that i use in my couples practice which you know i think is a fantastic method really really well researched but i'm really struggling to find a clinician um that offers this so you know that that is going to be a work in progress um but i mean we're only on episode five and i think series five is is turning into an absolutely cracking series um so once again i just want to thank deirdre so much you know it was a it was a fascinating interview uh, and i hope our listeners will agree you know so much information there you know that is helpful for i think a general listener um, but also families um that might be dealing with a family member um, experiencing an eating disorder. Incredibly difficult for the individual concerned um, and also incredibly difficult for the family system. Um, and as I said in the interview, I think um, a family member with an eating disorder, um, the, you know, the eating disorder and I think the effect on the family, I mean, it erupts through the family system. I mean, it's so difficult for the individual concerned and also so, so difficult for, for the family. Um, Deirdre talked about, you know, recovery. Um, she actually mentioned her, you know, her daughter is recovered and, you know, having a wonderful life now. You know, and I think it's so important that, you know, we talk about recovery. Um, and I know on some of our previous series, you know, we, we have had... Um, we have had lived experience guests, you know, we have had professionals talking about recovery from eating disorders. And I think it's so important, you know, because I think often people that are mired in an eating disorder feel that nothing can change. You know, they're never going to go into recovery, you know, but there are so many inspiring stories of recovery and lots and lots of people recover from eating disorders. So really, really great that, you know, we, we, we touched on recovery there. Um, our next episode will be in a couple of weeks um so watch this space um and as always thank you so much for our listeners you know we obviously wouldn't have a show without you thank you for joe i mean as i always say we're very much a team um i felt the show now but you know we work together joe um you know works in the background so hard um so check us out in a couple of weeks for our next episode thank you for listening and as always really look after yourselves look after each other and look after the planet and I'll catch you soon on the next episode.